What's cracking, yo? Welcome back to Boo TV. Appreciate you for stopping in. Like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell, stay notified, and let's get into the topic for today. What's cracking? What's cracking, y'all? Back with some more Larry Joe Bird content. If you're liking all our Larry Bird stuff, go check out our Larry Bird playlist as well as all of our other playlists on the channel. We do a lot of different stuff here, all right? Found another interview that's involved Larry Bird. The video is just called Bird Event. I haven't watched it before. But what I do know is that Jackie McMullen is in it again. And she was the author of the book When the Game Was Ours that she put together with Larry Bird and Magic Johnson. And if you haven't seen that video, you can check that out in our Larry Bird playlist and our reaction video playlist. Um, that whole video about the, the book she put out. And I'll put a link to that video in the description of this one if you're interested, all right? You have been warned. You have been warned. Y'all know me. I'm not into part one, part two, part three. If I got a long video, I'd rather sit here and do the whole goddamn thing. So this video, this interview is about two hours long, all right? So sit back, relax. Grab you some whiskey, grab you some peanuts, some popcorn, some lemonade, whatever you feel like drinking. If you can't finish it, bookmark it, come back to it later. But I'm here to do this whole thing in one run. You feel me? All right. Shout out to the boy Larry Legend, one of the greatest players of all time. Let's get into this interview. Oh, this is an Indiana State University thing. Very Bird Scholarship Dinner and Statue Dedication. Good evening and welcome to okay. this very special night. Before we start the program, I'd like to thank those who have made this evening possible. Larry and Dinah, thank you for being here. We are very excited about tonight's program. The statue dedication tomorrow and the scholarship funds this event is supporting will allow future generations of Sycamores to know what basketball is to Indiana State and to Terre Haute and what the Larry Bird legend is all about. Amy and Greg Gibson, thank you for all of your hard work in making this weekend possible. You are truly friends of Indiana State University and your efforts are deeply appreciated. Tonight's other MVP sponsors include Mary and Bl Mike Blackwell of MoCo, the Pacers, and the Herbert Simon Foundation. I would also like to thank special guests attending tonight, including the Larry Legend Foundation, who really started this project, and the members of the 1979 basketball team who created the most memorable season in Indiana State history. Thanks to you all for joining us on this historic evening and for supporting Indiana State University. This is going to be a great program. Thank you. It's often said that in Indiana, it's not just basketball, but something bigger, something closer to religion. We idolize our hoops heroes, and none of them is closer to our hearts than Larry Bird. into a room, he's the icon. Icon, legend, a person of integrity. His impact on basketball is immeasurable. He wasn't fast, he wasn't much of a jumper. But he had an uncanny ability to be in the right place at the right time, a skill born of thousands of hours of practice. I know they say guys work hard, but I I'd put Larry up against any of them. If he couldn't outrun you or outjump you, he would outwork you, outthink you. We all Love know about play, Larry's dead eye shooting, but scoring was just one aspect of his game. His passing was exquisite. Slow it up. No, it goes over the head. 
to McHale. He could guard anyone, and he could sniff out a rebound like a hound on the hunt. Rebound to Bird. Look at that pass. Oh, <laughs> that's is amazing. Oh, Doing my it, God. Not with flair or Shit. show business, but uh, doing it just powerfully. Unselfish to no end, wow. Bird stood up for his teammates, and he had a warrior's respect for his toughest competitors. Had Larry Bird been born anywhere else, would he be the basketball legend he has become? Perhaps, but the yeah. fact is, he is from Indiana. He is a sycamore, and for that, we're eternally grateful. That's a dope statue. I didn't know Indiana he had a statue. State University would like to welcome our host of tonight's show, Jackie McMullen. Jackie is a nationally recognized author and sports columnist and analyst for ESPN. She wrote for the Boston Globe for more than three decades, covering a wide range of high-profile sports events. Jackie worked with Larry Bird on his autobiography, Bird Watching, and also published the New York Times bestseller, When the Game Was Ours, co-authored by Larry and Irvin Magic Johnson. Go ahead, Jackie. I love this woman. Well, welcome everybody to I know it's going to be a very special night. Um, I was asked tonight to tell you how I first came to know Larry Bird. And I have to tell you, I have no idea. I covered the man for several years uh, as a reporter for the Boston Globe. And I had no idea if he liked me or hated me. I wasn't sure if he knew my name because he never called me by name. Until uh, one day, many years actually after Larry had done playing, I got a call. Um, from his personal advisor, his business advisor, Jill Leon, who said, so Larry's thinking of doing a book. And it was when Larry was the coach of the Pacers. And she said, um, so we're, we're now, this is confidential, we're now at the point where we're going to talk about some of the authors. So I thought Jill was going to run by some of my more famous colleagues and we were going to discuss which one would be the best for the job. And she said, so, um, would you like to do the book? And I said, well, let me think about it. Yes, of course I'd like to do the book. And uh, for me anyway, it was the beginning of a wonderful relationship with one of the most fascinating and wonderful athletes I've ever been around. And uh, so Larry, come on up. <laughs> All right, there. Have a seat. Love you, Larry. Boy, looking fly. I kind of like you. Bill. Yeah, I do. Thank you. So, Larry, when was the last time you were in here? First of all, Jackie, I see you let all my children in. How you doing up there? <laughs> This, this place hadn't changed at all since I left. It's, they keep it clean, beautiful. I love coming back here. All right, very good. So quickly, why is this, why is this place so special? What is it about this place? Because we won over 50 games, just lost one. <laughs> it's a good start. Now, I, you know, I, I, when I came to school here, I was in transition. I left IU and I was out. Uh, working down home. I, I came here as a young man to visit. I loved it, um, but I didn't choose it. So the second time I come around, I want to make the most of, <laughs> of the situation. And uh, I came here for three things, get an education, play basketball, and have fun. And I did pretty good in the third, the latter. All right. <laughs> Well, I think it's, it's understandable to me, to everybody here, that Larry Bird and Indiana basketball go hand in hand. Well, it does, Jack, and we've been together for a long time. You know, growing up in Indiana, you, you better be a basketball player, or at least try to be one. Uh, it's a special place. Um, I, I'm so proud to be from Southern Indiana, French Lake, Indiana. And, and come to uh, really a, a, really a, 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 a mid-major school and have success. And it ain't about me. It's about me and my teammates. If you look at the team I had in 79, I really, I really believe that if you looked at 
going into my senior year, I think it was just me and Brad Miley come back from the group of guys we had the year before. We had all new guys coming in. Uh, why he kept Brad, I have no idea, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we had all, a whole new group, and, and to succeed the way that we succeeded and the way we played the game, uh, I really look back on that, and everyone knew the role. Um, it, it was amazing. You know, win 33 games in a row and, and just how we did a lot of close games, but we played as a group. We played hard, we practiced hard, and we had success. And this is the reason we're here tonight, because we had a lot of success. But it wasn't just me, it was, it was a bunch of us. All right. And of course, it didn't start here. It started in French Lick in West Baden, Indiana. Let's, let's have a look. Larry Bird's story of humble beginnings in rural Indiana has a certain mythic charm. He was born in West Baden Springs to Joe and Georgia Bird on December 7, 1956, and grew up in French Lick, Indiana. We had like a two-bedroom home, six kids. Sports, in general, has always been part of our family's life. Larry brought his mother's work ethic to the gym at Springs Valley High. Under the tutelage of Coach... Let me just pause for a second. This is really... Yo, know, they really did an, an amazing job with this service for him. They, this, they got videos set up, they got interviews set up, high quality, editing, everything. Exquisite job. This is good. All right, all right, I'll shut up. Let's get back into it. Coach Jim Jones, Bird emerged as a fast rising hoops star. That was one of Larry's uh, motivations was to please him. I think Jim's been a big influence in Larry's life. He's a man that told me to respect my opponents but never fear him. A man that told me that pain is overrated. Bird mm. was remarkably unselfish, a rare quality in a high school Damn. player. Coach Jones often told Bird to look for his own shot and to take it. Bird complied and became the Blackhawks' all-time leading scorer. I can remember the day my dad came home and, and it was late at night and he was yelling and waking everybody up saying how Larry broke the the scoring record. By the end of his senior year, Bird had averaged 30 points and 20 rebounds a game, proving that the hick from French Lick was more than just a high school player. 30 is Welcome 20. to the stage, Spring Valley High School coach Jim Jones. Bowling! Different Jim Jones, my bad. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Jim. Thank you. So you told me earlier today that you had Larry as a really young boy, and it wasn't just for basketball either. Tell us where you first started to get to know a young Larry Bird. Well, it was in Little League Baseball. He used to help me get the field ready before we played. And then after I'd get the field ready, I'd have to go eat. So I tell Larry, I said, make sure you don't ride your bicycle on the diamond, because I go out. Look back through the rearview mirror, and here's Larry, <laughs> as fast as he could go. So these were the experiences we had, and then, of course, he went through our bitty basketball program, and that was his first opportunity to see a pro game. If you can believe this, the wife and I each chaperoned a full bus of boys to Louisville to watch the Colonels and the Pacers play. Mel Daniels. <laughs> and this was our first opportunity. And then as he came through the program, then he came in as a sophomore. And he could play, but he didn't have NBA stamped on him. He was 6'1", 135 pounds, super slow. <laughs> but he could play. First game, breaks his leg, breaks his ankle. I taped him up, tried to play, and he said it probably cost him two years of his pro career. But he hobbled around on those crutches, shot a basketball, dribbled a basketball, as many of you have seen kids do. He was there every day, never missed, always paid attention, got that cast off finally, and he couldn't, he couldn't move, stiff. So he had to run the suicide. We called them death valleys. In a certain length of time, I had already sent the roster in for the state tournament, which you had to do. He wasn't aware of this, and I told him, if you run it a certain time, you can play. 
he tried every day till he could do it. Mm -hmm. And then he started practicing with us, and we go to the state tournament. He hasn't played, but he could play. Had he not broken his ankle, he would have he would have been a starter before the season was over. So it was this type of kid that we had. We knew was going to be a good player for us. He gets into the sectional game, and he had no doubt his confidence level, and he assured me he could take care of us. And he did. He had two free throws to win the game. Pretty amazing. So it so, was quite an experience. But after not, after not playing all year, and as I recall, you said, when you first heard it, you said, well, let's just tape it up, but without anything on it. You taped it onto his skin, Oh, right? yeah, well, we don't mess around <laughs> putting it. You don't need it. And, uh, and you don't so, need pre-wrap. <laughs> we used to tell him, just spit on it and play. Right. But so you're, you're sitting out this whole year, and you're going every day on your crutches. And I think you told me at one point that's how you started using your opposite hand, right? Well, I definitely use the opposite leg of my <laughs> hand. But I, uh, you know, I watched practice, uh, you know, hobbling around out there trying to do different things. I worked on my left hand a lot. And that's what I always tell the little kids that growing up start playing basketball. You, your left hand's got to be just as good as your right hand. Not mm -hmm. to shoot with, but to pass with, to drive Dribble. with, whatever. And that was the time that I really de started to develop my left hand. Okay, so you, 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 get, the, you get the cast off, the, you're in the tournament, you're on the roster, your coach calls your name, you haven't played all year. What are you thinking when he's sending you into the game? Well, I, I can remember that. It's like it was yesterday. By sitting there, you know how you never get to play and you don't know why? Because you always think you're the best player. <laughs> and I heard my name, and I turned complete around, thought it was my buddies at the game hard at me. <laughs> and I felt this. <laughs> I mean, I was in that game in a hurry. I remember the first time I got the ball, I just turned and shot it and it went in. But, uh, you know, poor old coach, he, he struggles finding talent. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I break my ankle in two places and tore all the ligaments in it. He tapes me up and pats me on the butt and says, you'll be all right, go out there and get him. <laughs> I mean, about two laps up and down that court, I go, I don't know about this. <laughs> this was, it was we not good. We were checking his pain threshold. Yeah, yeah, well, you did a good job that night. <laughs> so in that game, though, you win the game with the free throws, and then you go on, and I believe you lost the next game. We lost the next game, and his comment was, we'd have won had you given me more playing time. <laughs> I thought I was going to start. <laughs> you know me, I thought, yeah, I'm going to play a lot tonight. He didn't play me. But, but when you come off the bench and hit a shot like you did in that game, that's what sort of makes you think, ooh, I like this, like with anything, right? No, I was surprised as hell, to tell you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just turned and shot it and went in. And, but at the end of the game, I don't know, Coach, what, 12, 13 seconds to go in the game, and I get fouled, of course, you know? Right. But I really thought I could make them, but, you know, everybody was nervous. But I went to the line and made them two free throws. They had a chance to win it, but after that game, I thought, you know, I'm going to start the next game. Right. And he didn't play me. <laughs> I don't blame him, but you know, <laughs> in your own mind, you think you're better than what, sure. what you are. But I also remember telling me that in the summertime, you guys would all be down at the playground working, working out, and Coach Jones would stroll on by and say, I'll be back to check on you. And yeah. sometimes that was an hour, and sometimes it was. Well, he didn't tell. I, I figured it out later on, but my friend Michael Cox was with me, and Coach Jones stopped by and said, hey, I want you guys work on this, and we'd work on that thing, work on it. And we was out there all day. Coach Jones sometimes come back in an hour, sometimes two. Well, he started playing golf. You know, it takes four and a half hours to play <laughs> golf. Then he'd show up and go, where was you at today? He wasn't out there, so we never left again. We stayed out there all the time. But he was such a, a mentor to all of us, not just me and Michael, and, but all of us. We had, after practice, we had ping pong tournaments. Uh, you know, we did everything together. And, uh, and, and Coach helped us all along the way. Can you imagine the thousands and thousands of kids that he's helped? Uh, I'm sure a lot of them didn't listen, uh, but the ones that did, pay their respect to Coach. Coach mm -hmm. Jones, when did you look at this skinny kid who hit the free throws and say, you know what, he's going to be something special? When was that moment? Well, it was it was very slow. I don't think we really thought that. We didn't realize what we had. We just we had the best, but we felt we really did. And I remember I used to tell Larry, regardless of how much time you put in, there's somebody down the road putting a little bit more. And he really took this to heart, and he intended to be, his desire to be the best. Mm -hmm. And each year he was better. And his senior year, Coach Holland gave him a lot more freedom. And he really exploded and became a great player. But he was always the ultimate team player. He was our best player as a junior. But yet, 
he was not necessarily the leading scorer. Could have been, but he took so much pride in winning. And, and he made everybody else play so much better. It's just unreal how well people relate to him. And he never says anything. You know, it's just... He says plenty now. Well, yeah, <laughs> as I told you, if he's your friend, you don't need, you don't need any enemies. <laughs> and these guys, some of these guys know, boy, he can, he can really get to you. So we have to ask, because we were just talking about it off stage, why did you resign Larry Bird's senior year of high school? He told me it was a dumb move, and I agree with him. <laughs> yeah, there's just a lot of things there. My, my children were in junior high, and I had 10 years in or 11. Mm -hmm. I was the athletic director. I was his guidance counselor. I had more problems with that than I did as him as a player. <laughs> but, uh, it, and then I hadn't been out very long at all, and I, I really felt like that that, that's really what I want to do. Mm -hmm. So I got it was really good for both of us. My career ended up decent. His career ended up fabulous. So it, it really worked out. And, and uh, you know, we've stayed very good friends all these years, and it's really been important to us. So your senior year, Larry, you know, teams start coming around, colleges, a little later maybe than... Man, I think that's absolutely beautiful after all the all these years. He's maintained a good rapport and a good relationship with his high school coach. They didn't even coach him his senior year either. You know what I mean? I, I think that's wonderful, man. That, that's 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 cool. That's cool to see. That doesn't that doesn't happen a lot. They do today, um, but one in particular, Danny Crum, was pretty persistent. Tell everybody about that. Oh, yeah. Well, coach was there. He, you know, he told me before the season started. He goes, "Hey, look, I'm not going to be around this year." Um, it's going to be better for me to stay away. When I started getting 30 and 40 points a game, he was right behind me. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> this guy was everywhere. But the, these coaches would come in, and, and obviously uh, Coach Jones would help me, you know, mm -hmm. sit down talk to him, and he was there all the time, which was a great help. But uh, Denny Crum came in, and he wanted me to come down to Louisville to uh, uh, visit the campus, and I didn't want to go to Louisville. Uh, Gary Holland high school coach my senior year played at U of L and and he liked it you know he never got involved in it but I uh, talked to coach Jones I said I don't want to go to Louisville that's not a place where I think I fit in and but Denny Crum came up one day and, and uh, he's probably been there two or three times Denny coach and he said look if I beat you in a game of horse would you come and visit my school and I go yeah no problem I mean I was hot that day <laughs> <laughs> so I never made the trip down to down the Louisville. <laughs> he was better than you thought, though, Denny Crum, right? Yeah, he could shoot. You know, Denny uh, Crum played for John Wood. Another one that was interested was University of Kentucky, and this was where Larry really, really enjoyed. He, I thought if he'd have picked a school, he would have been Kentucky early. And we were at Brownstown, which was one of our rivals, and Coach Joe B. Hall was there, and I approached him and I asked him, you know, What's your evaluation of Larry? So he's too slow to play at Kentucky. But at Kentucky was pretty good. Yes, but uh, this gave Larry the opportunity to stay in state. Very good. OK, I want to um, wrap up with one thing. Uh, when, you re when Larry retired, Coach, he sent you a little present in the mail, didn't he? I wonder if you can show everybody here in the audience what it was that he sent you. I get this small box in the mail, and I tell the wife, I, I didn't order anything. <laughs> and I take it out, and it's this beautiful ring. But more precious to me was the handwritten note mm -hmm. that he stuck in. It says, Coach Jones, in a token of appreciation, mm. I hope you, I've made you proud. Mm. And I would like to say, it's beautiful. The wife, the wife and I, are very proud of you and Dinah, and we cherish your friendship tremendously. And I'm sure everyone in here feels the same way. One thing I love about Larry Bird, his obviously his personality. It's, it's just a cool guy to be around, a fun guy to be around. I could just sit in a freaking living room and just chop it up with Larry, just BS and having a great time, talking about nothing but life, life, the pursuit of happiness, whatever. But one thing I love about him, you get so many pompous people, man, where they just feel like they're above everybody, especially you know, somebody of Larry Bird's stature, you know what I mean? And the dude's just so 
down to earth, was raised on good morals, a good solid foundation as a person, and all these amazing qualities uh, for him to do do a lot of thoughtful things for people unex unexpectedly, unexpectedly. And no matter no matter what he went through in life, no matter what he went through, through through all the fame and accolades and everything, he never lost sight of who he was. There's a saying that people say, money changes you, money changes you. Some lyrics from a rap song. They say, people say money change you, but money don't change you. Money only make you more of what you already are. Think about it. And I, and I will say, and I'm not from Indiana, but after the last couple of days, I feel like I am. I will say this, it's a good thing you didn't go to Kentucky, okay? <laughs> I'm pretty sure we all agree Indiana State is where Larry belongs. Let's take another look. Larry Bird was never one to follow the pack, so when he chose Indiana State over bigger college programs, it came as no surprise to those who knew him best. In his first season as a Sycamore, Bird averaged 33 points and 13 rebounds a game. Following season, his stellar play earned him All-America honors and the undivided attention of millions of Americans, including Boston Celtics general manager Red Arbach. Uh oh. Arbach drafted Bird with the sixth pick of the 1978 draft. The mere fact that Red was willing to risk taking Larry in the first round the year prior to Larry's graduation, that puts Larry on the map. But Bird had unfinished business back in Terre Haute. He returned to Indiana State for his final season. And what a season it was. It was a special season, so we knew it was going to be uh, something uh, that we will always remember. Bird led the Sycamores to an undefeated regular season record, culminating in an NCAA championship showdown between the nation's top two players, Bird and Michigan State's Irvin Magic Johnson. In the end, the Spartans were victorious, handing the Sycamores their first and only loss of the 79 season. We all realized that being 33 and 1 is not, uh, not as bad, but uh, we bumped in 34 and 0. But it was a lot of fun times, a lot of good memories. Still, Bird brought home a collection of honors, including the Missouri Valley Conference Player of the Year Award, NCAA All America, the Wooden Award, the Naismith Award and the USBWA College Player of the Year Award. Soon, Bird and Magic would meet again in the National Basketball Association, where the two players would become friends and fierce rivals as they ushered the NBA into a bold new era. Indiana State is known for Larry. There are some great athletes that have also come out of there that went on to play baseball or football. I just think Larry had the biggest impact because of basketball and Indiana. Indiana State will always be remembered for Larry Bird. Ladies and gentlemen, 1979 teammates Carl Nix and Bob Heaton. Well, okay. So, Carl, let's start with you. You walk into practice and there's this no-nonsense guy named Larry Bird who's not taking any, anything lightly, no slacking off in practice. Give us a sense of what practice was like with Larry, that, that, especially that championship year. Well, my, my first thoughts was, I ain't taking none of that. <laughs> you know, I'm from the south side of Chicago. I grew up with all that. I'm not taking it. You know, but once we got, once we start playing and and I've, I know, I've seen Larry's toughness and, and, and his dedication and passion for the game. Uh, it brought out the best in me. And what I did notice about Larry, referring to myself, is that, you know, I, I didn't back down to anybody. And I think that in some ways he respected that. So it was an unspoken bond, so to speak, with that because, I mean, Growing up in the, in the south side of Chicago, you know, that's how we played. And I think at some 
point, uh, he respected that. And from that point on, it was pretty good. It was a good bond. So Bob, Larry Bird, the player, you're, you're watching him. And when did you know, okay, wow, we, we have a chance to do something really good here with this guy? Well, the thing of it is, um, you know, I knew what his stats were in, in high school, his senior year. You know, he was 30, 30 points a game and, and 20 rebounds a game. And so I thought, who is this guy? You know? <laughs> and uh, it was one of those things where Larry, it, he worked for everything he got. And he came early and stayed late. And, and um, you know, the times he'd be at the boys' club and shooting late and so forth, that type of thing. But, but um, you know, he really didn't dem didn't wasn't a vocal voice and say, okay, you got to do this, you got to do that, work hard, that type of thing. But we just sense that we got to do the same thing because he's putting it out, you know, every, yeah. every day in practice and, and so forth. But uh, and that uh, that's just the way he was. And and thinking back, you know, living together there on South 11th Street after the season, the way. <laughs> I'll get into some of those stories later. No, no. But, <laughs> I'm, I'm married now. But Bob. anyway, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and my daughter's here. What happened on South 11th Street stayed on South 11th Street. But, uh, but you know, after the season, though, you know, he would uh, he'd be getting up early in the morning and taking off. I said, Larry, where are you going? And he says, well, you know, going to West Eagle High School to do a student teaching and work with Coach Ballinger there on the baseball team. And, you know, nowadays, I think once you use up your eligibility or whatever, you don't even think about graduating or that type of thing. But, but that was Larry's goal was to, uh, you know, graduate and, and uh, get his degree. And, and, uh, and he just had to, that's part of the sacrifice that he did. So uh, it was more to it than just on the basketball court, but we saw it also uh, uh, in life, so to speak. So, Larry, you got here a year before where you couldn't play and you had to. You had to practice with the guys, and as I recall, um, you took out your frustrations of not being able to play on him a little, and it even cost you uh, Coach Hodges calling you in to talk to you about it, right? Well, the first year I was here, I had to sit out a year. But the practice was my games, and uh, we used to be out there playing, and, and uh, Coach King, which is not with us, but he was absolutely a fantastic basketball coach. And we go in these practices, and the second unit, which I was on, we, we'd be playing pretty well against the first unit, and, and a lot of days we beat them. But it got to a point where Coach King would set me out of practice a lot because we were dominating the starters, and uh, I never could understand that. I got frustrated, and one day I left. Uh, went in, took a shower, and I said, I'm out of here. I can't play when I'm not playing. <laughs> but the next day I was called into Coach King's office, and he says, look, I've never had a losing season. Every day you come in here, you demoralize our starting unit. <laughs> they're sort of halfway through the season, and they're giving up because they can't even beat you in practice, you and your second unit. He says, the hell with it. You're practicing all the time now. And it made me feel good because that was my competition. I already sit out one year, and I played right. basketball, but not like this. And I was getting ready to come into college, and, you know, in my mind, I thought I was going to take this thing over. They thought I was good enough to really uh, put this uh, school on the map right away. Uh, but, uh, it, you know, it, it's a different feeling, you know. You don't know until you get out there. But once I got out there, I understood that special things can happen. So you guys upset Purdue early in the season. Was that kind of when you first started? Well, we didn't beat them my sophomore year, but uh, we beat them my no, juniors. No, I mean, I'm talking, yeah, I'm talking about the, the big year. Oh, the, well, the Purdue. Sorry, I'm scared. What's Purdue got to do with anything? <laughs> All right, then. I mean, you know, you, you see these names just like UCLA when Bill Walton play there, played there. Please, come on. <laughs> Can you imagine me playing against Bill Walton? He'd be crying the you rest. Guys would be Larry's so pushing hard. me. Larry's pushing me. <laughs> you do it like that. Well, the names didn't mean anything to us. We just played. We just but, played. But to the rest of the, the rest of the country, I well, think that's I when mean, they start saying, what's going on down I there? I know, but the rest of the country is like most people. Purdue, Indiana State. Purdue's a, a Big Ten powerhouse. Indiana State's a mid-major. But it didn't matter. You know, mm -hmm. we just played. And one thing about these guys, when, when they threw that ball up, it didn't matter if you started or come on. They played. And that's what we was 
drill to do. You, you guard and you play. And that was in our mindset. Now, do we know we was going to win 33? No, we didn't. We didn't know we were going to win 10 games. But when that ball went up, we were playing. And it happened to be, uh, the results happened to be good for us. Facts. So I think one of the things people are impressed with, you didn't have a ton of depth. The, the Magnificent Seven is the guy. Well, we had, we had some depth. That's a good point that Larry brings up. You get so many teams now where they, they view competition a certain way and then they don't play. They play down to the level of their competition. And these boys is just like, I don't care who you are. Your name is a name. Whoever's on the team, a name is a name. You are an enemy. You are, you are on the floor. And we are going to play like we play everybody else to try to get a victory. I like that. Okay. We were always stickly with Pretty dang good player. <laughs> Who's that? Leroy. No, Staley. Leroy Staley's here, isn't he? Eric Leroy, Kirk. here. You know, we a couple of times we got in foul trouble in some of the biggest games we won because of our bench. So, mm -hmm. I mean, give him credit, Jackie. Come on. All right, yeah. <laughs> I guess I better not go to Indiana State. But you guys did have a winning streak in that last year. Eight, it got to be 18 in a row. Um, one of the biggest games where it looked like that streak was in jeopardy. You two were on the bench because you fouled too much, Larry. Um, right, Carl, you two had fouled out of the game. Carl yeah. fouls. I had five fouls, and that's the only five fouls I had that year. <laughs> right. No, that was. So. That game was over. Let's have true. Bob tell us what happened at the end of that game against New Mexico State. Well, um, in, at, ha at the uh, timeout, you know, Coach Hodges is telling everybody okay i want you to be here on the floor and brad you go here and so forth that type of thing but he never told me where to go on the floor okay so so he probably didn't know your name <laughs> <laughs> oh dear so if you if you if you saw if you saw after the timeout i went clear down to the to the end of uh, of our under our basket so to speak in the corner well, I didn't see anybody at half court, so I thought, well, if we do get the rebound and if they throw it to me, I'm, I'm a non-factor. Mm -hmm. So I went to half court at that time. And, and then, of course, Greg Webb, he, he missed, the, missed the shot, and it just, you know, just went to Brad Miley, and Brad turned and threw to me. And, and as I uh, turned around and shot it, halfway, when the ball was halfway there, it looked like it was going to go over the bank board. I would have been bad. And... Um, and then it just, uh, you know, obviously it went in. But, but what really made it was that we were able to win in overtime. You know, I mean, if we hit the shot and we got, we got beat, you know, big deal. But as I tell people that a high school team could have beat them in overtime because they were just, they were just totally out of they it were done. at that yep. time. And, uh, because they were yelling, you know, 18 and 1, 18 and 1. And I think Slab Jones told somebody, you know, Maybe Larry or somebody, you know, hey, be sure you move away, you know, from the from the floor, because the crowd's going to come in. And so, uh, but it was uh, it was something like you know, one of those things. But uh, be at the right place at the right time. But things just had to fall in place. He had to miss the free throw. Went right to Brad Miley, and Brad turned and threw to me, and I, you know, went hit it and so forth. But uh, worked out well. It sure was. So Carl. Bradley decided, okay, we'll just shut down Larry Bird. I think he took three shots in the whole game against Bradley. Two, Two shots, okay. He had four points and 11 rebounds. And they thought, well, if we just shut off Larry Bird, we can beat Indiana State. Clearly not the case, right? It was the dumbest thing that Coach Versace ever had done as a coach. And I loved it, because I was playing horse out there. <laughs> you know, I was shooting left-handed, right-handed. I mean, I had all these open looks. I mean, I was working on my jump shot. And I needed to work on my jump shot a little more. You know, so, uh, I mean, they had him smothered, man. I was filling it up. Me and Steve Reed were just lighting it up. It's like, your turn, Steve. No, my turn. Uh, I think I ended up with 31, and Steve might have had, I don't know, 25 or something. And I was like, man, I hope all the games was like this year so I can get my numbers. <laughs> you know, because I, you know, he was getting the shots and he was getting the numbers, but I wanted to get my points too, you know. So yeah. uh, that, that was real good, but it was a terrible strategy. It was stupid, you know. And uh, uh, from that day on, I was able to 
you know, improve on my jump shot. And that helped me throughout the year. All right, very yeah. good. So, the eight, you know, when you start winning 18 in a row, something starts happening to this campus, right? Kids are sleeping out overnight to get your tickets. Can you guys just talk a little bit about what the atmosphere, like you, this, this town that you wanted to put on the map? Well, the atmosphere was already there, but we had success the prior two years, and our students was, you know, involved in the games. So, and, uh, but the more you won, the more people noticed, and, you know, I mean, I think a lot of the people in Terrell probably watched the games and, mm -hmm. you know, paid attention, but you know, when you start getting on the – covers of magazines and national news. The cheerleaders. Uh, I, I don't know. No. <laughs> but uh, but it, 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 it's pretty amazing. I can remember the first time I was on Sports Illustrated. I was just, you know, a little kid in a little college. First time I was put on Sports Illustrated, it all changed. So that's what happened to us as a team. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I was getting all the publicity. Carl was crying foul. Uh, <laughs> Carl was upset with me. Carl didn't like me, and Carl loved me, and you know, I always love Carl though. Oh man! And we're still together. Yeah. We work together. Ain't that some? <laughs> uh. But he didn't have anything to do with the draft picks. Let me tell you that. Actually, he did. I'll leave that alone. <laughs> No, no, for me, you know, um, I stayed on campus that year. You know, I wasn't like these guys here. I had a dorm room, and there was a lot of happiness on campus, being 18 and old, trust me. Uh, you know, I was, I was walking around like a rock star, you know. Uh, He's walking around, he was asking where I was at. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was, just, it, was just, it was just fun, you know, and, and, and the pre professors was was good with it. Um, you know, you do a little work, show up, they took care of you a little bit, you know. I mean, when you're winning, you're winning. I mean, and it was just a good time. It was a good time. It was a, it was, it was a great experience. Um, words can't really explain, uh, describe how, how the feeling that I got from being, from being a part of a team that was 18-0 at that time. One thing about um, all the toilet paper, um, well, how that started, a uh, fraternity brother of mine, Tom Perdue, he, uh, he went to Homestead Hall, and uh, the janitor, um, you know, they're cleaning and so forth, and had some toilet paper, and he grabbed a bunch and went to the game that night and handed out to some of my friends, fraternity brothers, and so uh, hit a basket, you know, and there goes the toilet paper first time and then so everybody kind of called on after that and um, I talked to Tom about a couple months ago and I told him about that Purdue thing and he told me the, the story and so forth about Homestead Hall but but it seemed like then everybody in the in the dorms would get the toilet paper out and then we hit the first shot and here comes the toilet paper that type of thing but yeah. and it just kind of kept going so that was one of the things that kind of took on the season once we kind of got it going and it was almost a trademark, you know, because we're going to have that toilet paper thing. But, uh, you know, some of the some things you know behind the scenes that a lot of people don't know about, but uh, how things happen, and it's kind of neat. So you, you kind of, even then, didn't love the attention, Larry, didn't, when all this was going on. And from what I understand, at the end, it, it was getting hard for you to go to class, even, because people were starting to... Well, one thing I did here, I went to class. <laughs> I mean, I was trying to get the help but like I mean, Carl did. I didn't meet them same no, professors. No. You know, where the hell were they at? But uh, I went to class, and uh, I had a lot of help here. We had we had tutors. We had people willing to, if, if you wanted help, and uh, just like any student athlete sure. to play sports. No, but what I mean is, from what I understand, kids were following you to class. They were asking for autographs. People were following you around campus. and. Well, I mean, my, my own teammates did that, so it wasn't no different. <laughs> I, I have to say this here. <laughs> I see Larry practice all the time, but I never seen him on campus. <laughs> and I never could understand that, never could figure that out. Hmm. You know, we talking about going to class. We all had classes together. The 
coach's yeah. schedule then, so we can look out for well, each other. I never you seen had, you had swimming I, I, and I, I, badminton. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> the rest of us went to real school. You was over in the PE department. <laughs> Carl took that basketball even three times. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> Sorry, Carl. Larry is roasting Carl. <laughs> You took basket weaving three times. What class you was in, bro? <laughs> Larry, a clown, man. Okay, so we get into the NCAA tournament, except for you fracture your thumb in the. You're serious, aren't you? I'm trying to be. I'm trying to get. I'm trying to get control back here. <laughs> uh, you fractured your thumb, right? I love how they're just having fun. They're just casual as hell. Having fun and Larry's like, oh, you you serious? You really trying to do this interview? <laughs> I love the energy and the vibe of this set right now. What, we can talk yeah, about it now. It's over. Know. It already happened. I, I hurt my thumb in a, the finals. That what's that? Missouri Valley Conference. Conference finals. Yeah. yeah. That wasn't a big deal. Well, you broke I mean, your it thumb. Sore, but it didn't. It, it was my left thumb. But it was fractured. Yeah, but come on, Jack. Just sticking to the facts, really. Well, it was, you know, it was sore, but I mean, yeah. they, they came out and said I probably wouldn't, might not be able to play and all that, but I, I didn't miss a practice or anything, did I? No. No. No, I was fine. Okay. No. Good. So you guys kind of, you, early on, you beat Virginia Tech, Oklahoma, and then you have Arkansas. Red comes to see you before the game and says, after you lose this game, I want to sign you to a Celtics contract. He said, well, it's basically that, but he said, look, you know, we draft you. We like you. We like you to come as soon as you're done here. We'd love for you to sign and come and play out the rest of the season with the Celtics. And I go, what? Never heard anything like it. Yeah. And I just said, look, I want to finish. I'm close to getting my degree. I got to do my student teaching. I'd, I'd rather do that than come to Boston the following year. But I know what he was trying to do. You know, I didn't know a lot at that time about the NBA or contracts, but he was trying to get me signed before the next draft came up because if he didn't, I would have went back in the draft again. Right. But uh, – it was pretty interesting to me that, you know, he would say something like that before one of the biggest games I ever played. Uh, but I understand Red, too. You know, he's, he's trying to put a team together. Right. So you play Arkansas, Bob. Sidney Moncrief, pretty good team. Take us through the end of that game. Sydney it comes Moncrief. back to you, doesn't it? Well, here we go again. Um, you know, at the timeout, we're, I don't know how many, 28 seconds ago or whatever it is. And, and, um, Obviously, you want to get the ball to Larry, and Moncrief, I think, was guarding him pretty pretty closely, and, and um, we just worked the ball around, and I think a lot of people have seen the, the video, maybe, but um, Steve Reed, you know, where are you, Steve? Uh, he had a he had an open shot, I thought, but um, he passed off to me, and and when I got the ball, I thought, um, I thought it was Scott Hastings, you know, on the Arkansas team. He was like a 6'9 player. And I, and uh, I thought he was between me and the, the basket, so figured that instead of going up this way with it, because I'd get blocked, uh, I kind of just used my body and kind of went with my left hand and um, bounced around and went in, of course. But it's just one of those things. But uh, it was one of those. But, uh, so um, you know, and then that just uh, you know. I figured, like, if it would have missed, we might have had a very good shot, shot to beat him anyway in overtime. But, uh, but it just again, be at the right place at the right time. But uh, uh, then we went on to Salt Lake from there. So I'm going to skip ahead now to the championship game, which we all know about. Still the highest-rated college basketball game in history. That's really saying something. Um, yeah. And the, and the previous summer, Larry, you and you and Irvin Magic Johnson had played together in a uh, the World Invitational Basketball Tournament, that that international round robin. And uh, in Irvin's mind, anyway, and you have to know Irvin to know this would be true. You guys were pals. You were buddies. You were good friends. So when they had the press conference leading up to the Michigan State Indiana State game, the game everybody in the country wanted to see. Uh, Irvin had every intention of going over and hugging Larry and how you been and let's trade some and so Irvin walked up He was with Greg Kelser. You were alone on the podium 
and Carl, I don't know why you weren't there, but this bothered your teammate. I don't either. Right. And, uh, and Irvin came over, arms outstretched, and w what did you do? Well, Irvin told you the story. I don't sort of remember it that way, but I didn't, <laughs> I didn't want no part of it. You know, right. I, I was there for a reason. I'm not in all that lovey-dovey stuff before games or after games. But my goal there was to prepare myself for the game. Um, it, it's just something that, you know, you just, I mean, what's he want, you know? I mean, I mean it's true. Are you, no. What do you talk to? You I know, know, I know him well. But, uh, it, <laughs> yeah, I know you know him well. You listen to everything he says. I love Magic. Magic's my man. But, uh... <laughs> I wasn't there for his statue on Bill and Larry, okay? I'm here for yours. She's like, loyalty, loyalty, bird, loyalty. No, but I heard you donated to it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 Well, I don't, but I, I know what you're saying, but it, it was after a practice, he sort of ran up and was going to wish me luck. And I oh, just he was kept being walking. Irvin. He was bringing yeah, Irvin, who, the guy we nice guy. Right. And uh, what he said afterwards, as he went back to the hotel room, was to Greg Kelser, he said, that Larry Bird guy's kind of a jerk. I agree with him. Yeah. Actually, I'm starting to agree with him, too. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, but that game going in, uh, to really was the game that everybody wanted to see. What was the atmosphere like, Carl, before you played? The night before, I'm sure you're both tossing and turning, but... You know, what, what were you, did you, I'm sure you guys thought you were going to win, but what worried you? What, what kept you up at night about that game the night before? Well, they, Michigan State Band kept us up. One, they was like playing outside our hotel all night, kind of kept us up. But it was funny, we all decided, some of the guys decided to go see a movie. And uh, we were sitting in the theater, and the next thing I know, Magic and some of the other guys are sitting in the same row. Wow. So I looked over and I was like, man, I ain't, no, ain't scared of that, you know. Uh, I'm not afraid. You know, they kind of like whooping at us a little bit, talking. And Yeah, but you're from the south side. Take care of it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but I, I needed a couple more guys to roll with me on that. Was I there? No, you weren't okay. there. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I needed you to roll with me on that. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, 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 was, it was one of them things where they was trying to like, scare you and all that. So I do remember that before the game, but, um, you know, I, I felt like our guys, you know, we were going to stick to our plan, stick to what we, what we knew, what, we, what got us there. Um, and, you know, other, other than that, it was just one of those things where Michigan State, they was trying to, to say things and do this and that to try to scare us, but I felt like we had our heads right uh, and our plans going into the game right. I think w the, the number one thing that really got us really loose as far as getting away from what Michigan State guys was doing, magic in them, is when Larry came up to us in practice and I shoot around, he said, you know, because we didn't like Billy Packer because he was like hating on us all year. He was just hating on us. Al McGuire was on our team. Billy Packer hated on us. So Larry said, hey, guys, come here. Come here, everybody come in. Everybody get a ball. I don't know if Larry remember this. Now, you remember that ball? He said, everybody get a ball. And we just bombarded Billy with the ball. Boom, boom, did. boom, boom. Did you really? And, yeah, we just killed him. <laughs> we killed him. And I thought that was the highlight of the tournament. <laughs> you know, and that kind of got us all kind of loose to me. Uh -huh. uh, and we just went into the game from there. You know, it's funny, Jack. They all threw their balls. I didn't throw of mine. Of course you didn't. <laughs> 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 So, Bob, you told me once that when that game started about four minutes in, you were already worried. Tell me, tell me why that was. Well, I remember um, sitting on the bench there, and uh, probably about four minutes into the game, they, uh, Michigan State stole a, stole a pass and uh, went down for a fast break. It was like four on one. And, you know, they laid it up, and I thought, wow, that's, that never happened this year. So, and they did it just, just like that, real quick. So right then I thought, uh, could be a long night. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but as I've told people, I mean, I, I give credit. They had, you know, Vincent and, and Ron Charles, besides Kelser and, and Magic, Kelsey. and yeah. of course Donnelly, but 
uh, those guys had long arms and they kind of they're with their zone defense they just push us out a little bit and, and you know Larry was seven for 21 I hate to bring it up but anyway I was like four I was like four for 14 and but they just they just took us out of our game but uh, uh, you know there's a couple times if we had a, would made a shot you know who knows but uh, it's one of those things but so when did you when did you think uh, we're in trouble well we, we made a comeback during the second half. I, if I remember correctly, Steve Reed hit two shots in a row, and yep. he passed up his that, first one, and it came down, and the guys were saying, shoot if you're open. He hit a couple shots, and we was making a run, and um, I don't remember all the guys. Maybe a little left Donnelly, is it? Oh, very Donnelly. good, Larry. He hit like three shots in a row, left-handed kid. I don't believe he missed uh, a shot in that game. But, you know, you, I could tell. I, I knew going in that game I was going to have to play the best game I ever played in my life for us to beat him. We won by two in Arkansas, against Arkansas. Against DePaul, we won by two. And I had like 16 out of 19 shots against DePaul. I was going to have to do that again the right. next night for us to have a chance to win. Uh, because uh, their length, uh, the way they guarded, they played the zone, a matchup zone with two right. guys around me all the time. And, and with her length and her speed, and, and you know they had some good players on the team. I knew I was going to have to have a big game. And like Bobby said, I shot horrible, like seven for 21 or, or something. I don't know. Five of eight from the line, which I know is something that's bothered you for many years afterwards. Well, you know, I missed a lot of shots, but I made some too along. No, of course, yeah, <laughs> of course you did. I, you, you've told me before that I. I as well as I know you, this seems to me the one game you never could get over. Is that still true? Yeah, you know, going into that game, you know, you win 33 in a row. We sure. had all the luck, and, you know, we're winning games by two. You just think somehow you're going to win the game. Right. Then you get to a point in the game, you go, uh-oh, this is not going to happen. <laughs> I mean, it just absolutely shattered me. I thought for sure we was going to come back here with the trophy. I'm sure my teammates thought that. We were all nervous. You know, we're kids. We're all nervous. Yeah. But somehow I felt that we're going to win the game. I thought going in that final game, I was going to have a monster game, you know. And uh, and as you're going along, you're not hitting these shots. You go, what the heck's wrong? Um, but uh, it, it absolutely crushed you. You know, I've told Irvin, you know, you, you've been with us. It, it's that's the one thing that he's got over me. You can talk about NBA champ, which is spectacular. You know how that is. But you only get in college. You might just, you know, you're not Bill Wall. You know, you don't win three college championships because they got all the best players in the country. I'm at Indiana State, we got good yeah. players, and you know, you get one chance. And we knew it was our one chance, and we didn't do it. I think everybody here is still okay with the season you had. I wonder if we could have the uh, rest of the players from that team stand up so we can acknowledge them. Congratulations to all you guys as well. All right, so Larry, the good news was that wasn't the end of Magic and Larry. That's the good news. It was just the start of it. It was just starting. We're going to take a look right now. Great college players don't always translate into NBA superstars, but Larry Bird immediately extinguished any doubts about his ability to play in the pros. Boston, you know, is known for a hard-working town, and Larry fit right in. I mean, the, the fans instantly fell in love with him. In his rookie season, he was named NBA Rookie of the Year, beating out his old rival, Magic Johnson. Throughout his career, Bird earned a reputation as a fierce competitor who walked the walk and talked the talk. Didn't have to worry about Larry coming to play. When you got a guy that you know they're prepared to play at a high level, that gives you an awful good feeling. Bird helped usher in a new and exciting era for the mm. NBA, taking its popularity to new heights. He never shied away from a confrontation and was notorious for his verbal barbs. He was also famously clutch. At the end of close games, everybody knew the ball was going to Bird, and there was nothing they could do about it.
he proved a lot of people wrong, and I think that's maybe why he worked so hard. Pull up. He wanted to show people that, you know, I am good, and you better not come at me because I'm coming right back at you. In 13 seasons with the Boston Celtics, Bird led the team to 12 playoff appearances and three NBA championships. Along the way, he made 12 All-Star games, won three MVPs, and scored more than 20,000 points. After winning an Olympic gold medal with the Dream Team in 1992, Bird announced his retirement from the NBA. Yes, I'm going to miss playing for the Boston Celtics because I was very proud to play for the Boston Celtics. Bird is still considered one of the greatest NBA players of all time. Larry made the fans in Boston proud, but nothing could compare to the pride felt back home in the state of Indiana. Please welcome to the stage Larry Celtic teammates Bill Walton, Quinn Buckner, and Joe Klein. Well, this is a fine bunch now, isn't it? <laughs> How cool is this? It's Come on. pretty cool. All these folks come filing in. Looks like a Grateful Dead concert. Oh, Everybody having Bill, fun whoa, out whoa, here. Bill, whoa, slow down. Slow down. Slow down. Whoa, whoa, whoa. This is Larry's show. Slow down. <laughs> He's been up here all night. Come on, they gotta somehow bring somebody else in. Here we go. And we and we haven't even brought in the guys who made it all possible for us at the professional level. Donnie Walsh, Mel Daniels, and Bob Love, who have all come here tonight to pay tribute to this incredible legend right here. Thank you, guys. Salute to the boy Larry Legend. Salute. And then how about Larry's family? I mean, wait, wait, we Bill, who we is, that, is this you are here? Who's doing this? My job here is done. Oh. We got Mark. <laughs> Mark is here. Jeff is here. Linda is here. Eddie is here. Bro, I love Bill Wallet, man. He is a whole vibe. Bill is an entire vibe. And then I heard the great story from Coach Jones about getting that ring and the letter and everything. Dinah, that was so nice of you to do that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> There's Dinah right there and Mariah, how cool. What a beautiful family, Larry. Thank you, Bill. All how right, Bill. Yeah. I love Larry Bird. We know that, Bill. And I love Terre Haute. Okay. Bill, I promise we'll get you in a minute, I promise. Can we I'm start now, I got Bill. invited back. Bill. Here. Can we start now? Can we start? <laughs> so I do want to start with your first championship, which actually none of these guys were here for. Nope. And, uh, and the reason I want to get to that is, well, for a lot of reasons. But one of them was because you said this one's for Terre Haute, which I always thought was amazing. Yes. Why did you, why did you really feel compelled to do that? Well, I didn't feel compelled. I just, you know, I. You're we, killing me, Larry. You're killing me here. Okay, I felt compelled. <laughs> um, <laughs> compelled that uh, we played uh, against Urban the first time. And, you know, Jackie, if you remember that series, which I know you do, we lose game one. We lucked out one, no, game two in overtime. We get blown out by 32 in game. Am I right? Yeah, but yeah, I was. 30, yeah. 30, mm -hmm. 32 or something. Pretty good. Come back and win game four. I said, how in the heck are we still in this? You know? It's well, two can, and two. Let's, let's go back to game three, though. What did you call your teammates after game three, remember? Bunch of sissies. I know sissies. what I Bunch called. of sissies. That was great. You, no, I know what you called us. I called all of us. You called, uh, he said we played like a bunch of sissies is exactly what he said. He said we, we, not you. I didn't say that you. That, whoa. <laughs> I meant you, but I have, somehow it just came out we. <laughs> <laughs> it generally what, does. You were obviously upset because it was a bad performance. But what? Awful. Were you just trying to motivate them, or did you really feel that way, or no, both? No, I felt that way. We just got. They had us down 38. Remember, we kept yep. sitting there running too fast for us. We can't catch them. <laughs> <laughs> we can't catch them. But uh, somehow we end up winning Game Four. Go back to Boston, and we say, now we got to put the hammer down. We cannot let them get out here with a win. We win Game Five. We had a. I can't stop looking at Larry Bird's finger, dude. I can't believe he shot on that finger his whole career. And still one of the best shooters in the league. Could you only imagine if his finger wasn't shaped like a boomerang? Could you imagine how lights out he would be, bro? Crazy. 
pretty good lead in game six, lose it. And game win. seven was absolutely crazy. But after the game, you know, they were asking some questions. I, I won a, a little trophy, and they're asking a couple questions. <laughs> a little so, trophy. A little, a little trophy, MVP. <laughs> it would be the trophy. MVP trophy. Of and it just it hit me. It, everything just came back to 1979 and how Irvin got the best of us then. And finally, I got a rematch with him, and we beat him. And, and I meant it. I wouldn't have said it if I didn't mean it. You know, it, sure, it was for Terrell. Yeah, very good. Hey, Quinn, I, I want to go actually go back to the year before that, which was a, was a bad year, as you remember. Ooh. And uh, uh, oh. Bill Fitch was a coach who you uh, loved, Bill Fitch. You had won your first championship with him in 1981. And, um, but there were some other players on the team that had kind of quit on, not no. kind of, they had quit no. on Bill. Let, let me, I'm going to do a bill on you here for okay, a second. Okay, go ahead. That's good. It was a mutiny. It was. I, I, ladies and gentlemen, I, this, I got traded from Milwaukee to Boston and I thought I had died and gone to heaven because I always visualized myself as a Celtic. Should try getting traded from the Clippers to the Celtics. Man, now that. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I, or the I, Kings. I had never seen, <laughs> I had never seen anything like this. Um, we had guys, literally, I think we were down 10 with two minutes and we were walking the ball and intentionally walking the ball up the court. And you could just see that lack of effort. And it was the first time that the Celtics have ever been swept in a playoff series. I remember that distinctly. And it, it was something for those of us who were fortunate to come back was a big part of the reason that we were successful the next year. I'll never forget that. What did Larry say to you guys at the end of that year? Or you, I know you worked out with him that summer, but you knew the mindset, his mindset that summer. Right? I actually came to work out with him in the French Lick, and I realized what I, 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 I thought I worked hard. I really did. And we started running up and down the hill over there. You remember <laughs> running up and down that hill. If you've been to French Lick, there's a hill that's on the backside that now goes up to Pete Dye. I thought I was going to die. <laughs> and I realized, and he, he'd been doing it routinely. I had come to visit, and I was doing it, and I knew his intent was to get back there. Uh, I, I'm, I'm speaking for him, so that's, that's always dangerous. His passion for being so supportive of whatever it is he's doing, and in this case, the Celtics and, and, and Red Orbach had him at a high level in terms of his competitiveness and his ability to prepare, because you can't have success unless you prepare. I don't know anyone in my life that's ever prepared better. Pretty good. Quinn, you're not going to tell the story about the time that you, me, and Larry, and Dr. Root went down to French Lick, made the pilgrimage <laughs> Bill, down there? Wait, Bill, wait, this is a family show. What is your problem? <laughs> <laughs> so Larry Yo. had this guy, a state trooper in Indiana, who was named Dr. Root, and he drove us everywhere. And every time he'd get on the radio, he'd say, I got Larry Bird in the car, Larry Bird coming through, clear the road. And we're driving 100 miles an hour in the middle of the night from Indianapolis down to French Lick, and we're going through Gloomington. And Larry and I are trying to break into Quinn's bag to get Coach Knight's phone number so we could go over to his house in the middle of the night and use some of Bobby's toilet paper. But that wasn't going to work. And then we're down at the, at, the, at the estate there, at the palatial estate in French Lick, gathering all the dirt. And we're, Quinn and I are out on the basketball court, shooting around, having a grand old time. And Larry is up on the hill with his golf driver. And he's raining golf balls down at us from 300 yards away. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Welcome to French Lick. Oh, how about the church we went, we went to there, Jubal's? I think, I think Bill went to Grateful Dead concert before he came over here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good show, too. Oh, my gosh. But playing All basketball straight. with Larry Bird was like singing with Jerry Garcia. It was like talking whoa, science whoa, with whoa, whoa. Albert Einstein. Uh, all, all, it was all, like all, talking all. history with Eugene Debs. Yeah. It was just absolutely fantastic. Yeah, okay. <laughs> what a dude, I could listen to Walt and talk all day. This dude is, he's good. <laughs> I love all his, I love all his analogies. <laughs> I never played with a better player than Larry Bird. Did you ever play with a better player? Than that, How about you, Joe? Do you speak, Joe, or do you just sit here? <laughs> they didn't get my ass a mic for a reason, so yeah. <laughs> I never saw a player ever who was able to ignite the home crowd the way that Larry Bird did. And his ability to inspire, his ability to include, 
I remember my very first game in uh, Boston Garden. Now, I had been in the Boston Garden with the Grateful Dead and heard the fans chant, Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. And I'm in there at this very first Celtic game, and the fans are starting to chant, Larry, Larry, MVP, MVP, and the scoreboard is shaking up and down. So I go up to him, I said, gosh, I can't hear, what are they saying? Are, are they cheering for Jerry? And he said, no, they're cheering for me, Larry. <laughs> and then at the very end of the game, we're gonna win the game unless we miss our free throws. And so I'm inbound in the ball and I throw it to Larry, who goes up, gets fouled immediately, and goes up and he makes two free throws. Very next time, same exact thing. I throw it to Larry, two more free throws. Next time, Larry's guarded, I throw it to DJ. DJ goes up there and knocks down two free throws. Next time, Larry's guarded, DJ's guarded, I throw, I throw it to Danny Ainge, who's the best free throw shooter on the team. And as Danny's walking up there to shoot the free throws, Larry walks up to me and says, hey, Walton, I know this is your first game here, but if you want to stay on this team, you throw the ball to me every time. <laughs> and if you can't get it to me, then it's okay to throw it to DJ. If you can't get it to me or DJ, just throw it to me anyway, and I'll take care of business. There was nobody like Larry Bird. Oh, my gosh. The Phil, things he would do. Phil, you once said that Larry didn't just give you your career back, he gave you your life back. What did Absolutely. you mean by that? You have not spent six years of your life on the Clippers. <laughs> <laughs> I have not. <laughs> but to know what Larry Bird was like, not so much as a basketball player, but more as a human being. And that's what's so special for me to be here tonight. Because not only when I got here today in my fabulous hotel room, and President, President Daniel Bradley, he left a bottle of whiskey in my room. <laughs> this guy's a clown. Now, now that's a man who knows how to build a program. I feel that. And then I was looking through this fabulous program, and be sure, be sure, and everybody keep their program. Larry's signing them all in the lobby, in the lobby after the show tonight. <laughs> but we were sitting at table eight, table eight, which was Scotty Wedman's number, and Scotty was just absolutely fantastic. But I opened up this page, and and there's Larry He'd drawn a play for himself. <laughs> but Larry. Uh, we're playing a game. We're playing a game down in Atlanta. And this is how long ago this was, because Atlanta was a good team. And <laughs> they had Dominique and Doc Rivers and Reggie Theus and Kevin the Penguin Willis and Tree Rollins and all these guys. And we are getting hammered. We're just getting killed. We're down 25 at the half, and they're all trash talking and fans are throwing stuff at us and they're going, we're going to kill you Celtics, Bird, Walton, McHale, Parrish, DJ, you guys are all frauds, what are you talking about? With the exception of Dominique Wilkins, who had too much class to ever say a thing. So we come in at halftime, we're just sulking in there, with tails between our legs. We walk in, we're sitting in the locker room, and Casey Jones, our fantastic coach, the most like John Wooden of any coach I've ever been a part of, Casey walks in, he looks at us, looks at his watch, doesn't say a word, walks over to the cooler and pulls out a beer. Pops the beer, goes and sit down, pounds down the beer, just sitting there. Finishes the beer, looks at his watch, looks at us, goes over to the cooler and gets a second beer. Pops the beer, pounding it down, doesn't say a word. Looks at his watch, looks around at us, goes and gets a third beer, does the same thing. And then he gets up, looks at his watch for the final time and he says, let's go. So we go out there and we're warming up for the start of the, uh, the third quarter. And they got a record sellout crowd there at the Omni. And they're going to start the third quarter. And you watch an NBA game and nobody wants to ever take the ball out of bounds because they know they're never going to get it back. Larry Bird always took the ball out of bounds. The selfless sacrifice that was Larry Bird's defining personal characteristic, what he would do to make other people's dreams come true. He's going to take the ball out of bounds, and that referee comes, and the referee hands the ball to Larry to start the third. We're down 25. 
Larry takes the ball and pushes it back into the midsection of the referee so that he can't get away and the referee is like startled and staggered. What's going on here? It was all right there right in front of the Celtic bench. And Larry looks right into the soul, right through the eyes of that referee. And he says to him, we're not going to quit. You make sure you don't quit either. The guy just like melted on the spot. Larry hit 11 <laughs> straight <laughs> shots to start the third, including seven threes. We were tied at the end of the third. We won in overtime. We did not need a plane to get home last night. That night. Larry Bird, you're awesome. So tell me we what the shy retiring Bill Walton brought to that great 85 86 championship. I don't know if any of y'all familiar with G Unit. Got any G Unit people in here, but. Bill Walton reminds me of Tony Ayo. When he goes into a room, he kind of just uh, takes over with his personality. That's how Tony Ayo is when he's in these group discussion, group interview kind of things. Championship team. I am. <laughs> he pumps you up. <laughs> Seem like you're a very, uh, great player. But, <laughs> but, but to tell you what kind of human being Larry Bird was. <laughs> you know, first I want to clear something up. Casey Jones never drank a beer at halftime. That's the biggest <laughs> bunch of BS I ever heard. Come on. Unless Bill was drinking one with him. <laughs> we love Casey Jones. How come he's not here tonight, man? That guy's awesome. We would do anything for Casey. The same way we would do anything for Larry because we knew he would do anything for us. That guy, when he was in Boston, every what, are we sitting at a bar or something and talking? What? This is about Larry. I'm trying to tell a Larry Bird story. Well, this is the MC, Bill. Bill, I'm Jackie, sorry. You can, go use the, you can go use the ladies' room now. It's fine. Ooh. Look. Oh, that'll go over well. We're Ooh. not coming back here tomorrow. Dude. <laughs> Walton is wild. Listen, in, in today's age, in today's age, if Bill Walton said that to her, they would be canceling this guy, dude. He'd have to give a hundred apologies on Twitter, a hundred apologies on Facebook. Uh, he'd have to get counseling on sensitivity and all kinds of things. If he said that to her today in this era, <laughs> he can go use the ladies' room now. Tomorrow, for, oh, we are coming back tomorrow, but we're not coming back to this place for this dinner. There's only gonna be one Larry Bird statue in Terre Haute, and we're here tonight. So what's the problem? You got a problem? Okay. I got a problem with you talking this long, <laughs> if you want to know the truth. So, every company in Boston wants Larry to be the... Yeah, dude, don't worry. I... Every... He is dead ass serious. He is not feeling Bill Walton right now. <laughs> oh my God. This, inter... this is awesome. This is good content. I am loving this. I just heard her whisper something back to him. He's like, bro... Pass the mic. This is total. This is Tony Ayo right now. <laughs> I'm loving this. What did she say to him? The company in Boston so wants Larry that. to be their spokesperson, and he says no. I'm not. Let me that. rewind. It's not for me. I'm not gonna. Okay. I got a problem with you talking <laughs> this long. If you want to know the truth. So every company in Boston wants Larry to be the. Yeah, dude, don't worry. Every company in Boston so wants Larry that. to be their spokesperson, and he says no. I'm not into that. That's not for me. I'm not going to do it. And this one guy kept bugging Larry. Okay, I'll stop. What would you like to talk about? Yeah, let's, let's, we might as well get comfortable over here because. <laughs> what do you want me to do? I love Larry Bird. We know that, dear. So, Joe. It was so much fun <laughs> playing with Larry Bird. <laughs> Oh, my Christ. gosh. You're one of a kind. Bill, maybe you should go to the ladies' room. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Very Bars. nice. Come uh, on, Marv's not here tonight. I love you. You know that. Okay, but I do want to I want to get Joe involved here. And, Joe, you you came. Why am I here? <laughs> you're here because you're a good <laughs> friend of Larry's and a great teammate. The house. It's you like, do. It's like when I played. I got to sit and watch Larry and all these great players. It was awesome. But you, you played with Larry when Larry was really hurting, when, when his back was starting to fail him. You saw him do some amazing things when he was a lot, a lot less than 100%. Well, I mean, I, I didn't get to, I always tell everybody, I didn't get to be a part of the championships, but I got to be a part of something that was more, to me, was more special than championships. 
I saw this dude right here go out against Portland, and I mean, we were in a we were in a playoff hunt, and he and he had a classic thing on. I mean, from here, I mean, it was it was a it was full body, body brace. It was yeah. body armor. He got 48, and wearing that, and hit the game shot and called it when he hit it. And I mean, I was like sitting there, and I mean, I never saw a guy that, I mean, he was in serious pain. I mean, it, it wasn't a, a ankle. I mean, it, I mean, it was, it was serious pain. And he did everything. I always laugh at him all the time. I called him last year. I saw him in Miami. And I, you know, I just happened to turn on the TV and I was sitting there and he was in Miami at a game or something a year or so ago and Dan Dyrick was sitting next to him. And I was like, good, that's his back doctor. I was like, good God, man, you know, is that, is that guy ever going to leave you alone? I mean, <laughs> I mean, he was, I always saw him, but I mean, every day just for him to go to shoot around, just for him to practice, uh, and then the games, he would sit there, and nobody saw it. I mean, we would, I remember we were playing Detroit in the playoffs, and I mean, they brought a bike, and I mean, I remember sitting there, and I'm like, it was my first year, and I was like, why the hell are they bringing a bike into the locker room? I mean, what? And I mean, he, he rode the bike for an hour to get, his, to get his back loose so he could play the game. And to me, those are greater memories to me than any championship because I saw the will of a guy. I mean, Larry could have hung it up. Larry could have said, this is too much. But he knew how much uh, it meant. For us, we, we, we had no chance. I mean, we, we, we had no chance without him. And, I mean, he sacrificed a lot of pain and did a lot of great things so that we could have a chance. And, and we weren't good enough, and, and we were banged up and, and everything, but, my God, I mean, the, the pain that he went through to give us a chance, not, not to win it. You know, we weren't going to win the championship, but we had a chance just because of the of – the, the sacrifice he went through every day to give us that chance. And the other great memory I had, and I told him this earlier, it's my, it's my greatest memory in the NBA. I mean, I'm playing 15 minutes a game. Ed Pinckney's playing 15 minutes a game. And we'd come into Hellenic College, and we'd sit in that little nasty locker room back there. <laughs> and we'd, nobody felt like practicing. I mean, you could tell that the locker room was down, and everybody's sitting in there, and it's just like, you know, we've been three games and four nights or whatever, and Eddie Pinkney would be sitting there putting on his, putting on his shoes, and Larry would come in there and he'd have his bag over his shoulder and his gray sweats on, and he'd stand over in there, and he'd, he'd stand right over Ed Pinkney every day, and he'd go, Ed Pinkney, Ed Pinkney. I heard I'm this. I'm going to torture your ass today. <laughs> <laughs> And I mean, you know, Bucky, I mean, and it was on. I mean, and then it was on. I mean, I'd start laughing, and, and, then, and then Chief would look over there and go, what the hell are you laughing at? I'm going to torture your ass, too. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, then it was on. And I mean, we'd have, I mean, nobody felt like practicing, but he'd come in and just utter those little remarks, and we'd have a great practice. But the burden of, the burden of being Larry Bird. And... A lot of us have experienced incredible pressure, responsibility, and the burden, and the, the sacrifices that people like Dinah and Mariah and Connor have had to put up with their entire life, the family members. Because when you have someone like Larry Bird, who's like Bob Dylan, who's like Jerry Garcia, when he's the savior, and he's gonna solve all your problems, and he's gonna take care of everything. But now just think, of the kindness and the sense of responsibility that he has. Because all the people, so many of you as youngsters, would grow up idolizing Larry Bird. And everything he said, everything he did, meant everything to you. And that was the way it was for our four young children who were growing up, and they were six through 10 or 11 in Boston when we were playing there. And so one of those children went on to make it in the NBA. And he's playing for the Fakers. And it was, it was a very special moment because 
Luke and his team, the Lakers, were playing against the Boston Celtics. And Larry said at the Basketball Hall of Fame, when Coach Fitch and I were most honored to present Larry, that if you hadn't been a member of the Boston Celtics, you really didn't know what it was like to be in the NBA. And so on the eve of this incredible matchup, historical as it was, Celtics-Lakers, and our young son is chasing his dreams to try to make it happen, who had grown up with Larry as his favorite player. On the eve of the first game, Larry Bird, the ultimate Celtic, calls up little Luke Walton on the phone. I didn't the know this. Fourth game and says, Luke, good luck. I'm really pulling for you. And what that does, as I'm sure he's done to so many of you, because Larry, he never talks about himself. He never promotes himself. I mean, all this stuff about magic, Larry, that's... I absolutely loved Luke Walton. Uh, as you can see, hardcore Laker fan, if you didn't know, man. Luke Walton really just, he was a great role player, man. Just played the game at the perfect pace, man. Just fit, fit within the triangle. So good. Kobe loved him. Kobe defended Luke Walton like nobody else. And if anybody ever said anything about Luke, because people always be like, why is Luke Walton on this team? So he's wasting a roster spot, blah, blah, blah. Kobe would sever their head off and say, you don't know basketball if you don't understand Luke Walton. Luke, dude, I still remember this game. I, I'm going to make this short, but it was a, a game against the Cavaliers. LeBron James rookie year. Kobe got hurt that game. He, he tend to got hurt against the Cavaliers for some reason. And Luke Walton just took over that game with like, just an all-around game with incredible passes. I, I rock with Luke. It's all Magic Johnson. I mean, come on. Larry, he doesn't want to talk about that stuff. Why do you want to talk about a game you lost? Right? I mean, it, was like, it was like that big HBO special, which was fantastic. But that's all Magic Johnson, who's constantly bugging HBO. Oh, come on, do this show, do this show, do this show. And, and Larry said, I don't want to be part of this. Come on. Finally, Larry agrees to do it. And so immediately, Magic says, okay, he calls up HBO. Larry said he'd do it. Get him on the phone right now and book him. So the producer calls up Larry. Says, Larry, thanks for a lot for doing this. I'm going to need four eight-hour days. And Larry, said, and Larry says, you got two hours. <laughs> the guy producer quickly on his feet thinking, okay, Larry, I think I can get it done in two five-hour days. And Larry immediately comes back with, you got one hour. <laughs> The guy realized he had lost completely. And so Larry said, be at my office at the Pacer building there, 10 o'clock on Tuesday. I'll give you an hour. So the guy says, well, we got to have lights, camera, makeup. You don't need any of that. Just show up with your crew at 10 o'clock be ready. The guy shows up at 7. Larry's already in the office. Larry's walking up and down the halls but won't look out into the, audience, into the lobby where these guys are looking at Larry. Come on, Larry, give us some time. Where are we going to set up? we got to do hair and makeup. At 10 o'clock to the second... 10 o'clock to the second, Larry walks out and says, come with me. And so these guys grab all their gear and they walk out and they go downstairs in the elevator down to the bottom restaurant there. Larry has his key, opens up, turn the lights on, says, turn that camera on and roll. And Larry sat there and made that show. And he was absolutely so perfect, so accommodating, so gracious and so kind. And then they invited me to the premiere in Los Angeles. And they send a big car for me, and I'm driving up there, right? I'm working the whole time and on the phone and just doing everything. And I come over the hill. It's right there in Westwood at UCLA. I come over the hill, and I tell the driver, stop the car. Stop the car immediately. I said, what's wrong? And the guy said, what's wrong? I said, I pull out my phone, and I call Larry on the phone. I said, Larry, there's a big problem here, because I'm here in Los Angeles. I'm going to this premiere, and I just came over to the hill to the Bruin Theater in Westwood. And on the marquee where all the lights are and all the starlets are, it says magic bird i said that's wrong larry that's the wrong order of this documentary here and larry immediately jumps in and says don't worry about a thing bill they're going to do the same thing next week in boston they're going to say, it's going to say bird magic i promise there you, you. Go. i love larry bird all right, all right. we're almost done <laughs> i do i do we're just going into overtime jack we are i do just want to ask you um all those years with the Celtics, all the memories you made for people in Boston, three championships, um, what they meant to you. You know, you've obviously moved on. 
for good reason and you've come back home to Indiana, but just if you can let people know what Boston meant to you and what, obviously it's where you spent your entire career. It was incredible. I mean, Boston's got the, the best sports fans that I ever seen. I mean, they're, they are incredible. I mean, There's one of not them. just for the Celtics, but the Red Sox, the Bruins, and, and the Patriots. I mean, they live it every day. I mean, all they talk about, whatever's in season. If basketball's in season, the Patriots are playing. I mean, uh, it's, it's incredible. Jack, you know how it is out there. He, he's not lying about that. So incredible. I mean, I, I was so honored to be able to put on the jersey and, and play at a place that they cared. You know, every night they come to them games, they wanted to win. Uh, one of the best lines I ever heard was, I think it was 86, we were playing uh, Houston, and uh, we're going into game six, and the crowd is absolutely going berserk all about an hour before the game, and some of the guys were still shooting before they came in, and, and it was said that, hey, I'm telling you, them fans want blood out there, and they don't care whose it is. We lose, <laughs> it's our blood. Right. And it, he, it was right because, man, that place was rocking that day. I mean, it's always rocking. And in that game, Larry Bird played his self-admitted and acknowledged greatest game that he ever played. Because in a game that had tons of guys that were winners of the genetic lottery, 7'4", Ralph Sampson, 7'0", Akeem Olajuwon, 7'0", Robert Parrish, 6'10", Kevin McHale. We called him Frankenstein, though. Kevin could stand up straight as can be. He's 6'10", but dangle those long arms. He has scratch his shins without bending over. And Kevin, when he needed that foot operated on and had the screw put in, they just took the screw out of his neck and put it right into his foot <laughs> there. Fool. Frankenstein. And here's Larry. Here's Larry, who can't jump this high. I saw him dunk in one of these videos. I couldn't believe it. It must have been a, a Photoshop or something. And then... And Larry who couldn't run faster than I can move today. I'm 61 years old, I've had 37 orthopedic operations. Both of my ankles are fused. I've got a fused spine and my knee's just been replaced. Larry at his peak couldn't run faster than I can move today. <laughs> yeah, with all these guys playing above the rim and just dominating everything, there was Larry grabbing every rebound, every single rebound. And mm -hmm. instead of just putting it right back up, he would go run out to the three point line and just throw it up there and not even look at it, just run down the court going like this. And in that game, I was playing so poorly that Larry Bird came up with his regularly repeated mantra where he would go to Casey Jones during the dead ball situation and says, Casey, you can either take Walton out or you're going to take me out. It's your <laughs> choice. <laughs> That's true. And Casey Jones uh, always take made it out. The, the right decision. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you very much, Celtic champions. All right. And uh, we got to go now. We do we have, love to go. Larry you have to stay. We love Terry Bird. We love Terry Larry signing autographs. After 15 in the years in the NBA, Larry Bird had become an international superstar. But at heart, he remained connected to his Indiana roots. And when the opportunity arose to coach the Indiana Pacers, Bird accepted. Well, the excitement uh, among our fans and our players. Uh, when it was announced that Larry would come back and would coach the Indiana Pacers was unbelievable. As a coach, Bird was stoic, serious, and straightforward. His players responded to his no-nonsense leadership style, and in his first year, Bird earned NBA Coach of the Year honors. In his third year, he led the Pacers to their first ever NBA Finals appearance. Bird stepped down from coaching the following year, but he soon returned to the Pacers as president of basketball operations. You're talking about one of the top players to ever play professional basketball. He brings that to your organization. It automatically rises the tie, which means everything that comes with that has to rise as well. In 2012, he was named NBA Executive of the Year, making him the only person ever to receive Rookie of the Year, MVP, Coach of the Year, and Executive of the Year from the NBA. Today, Bird's career continues as the Pacers pursue their first NBA championship. And Larry Bird is a guy in a very unselfish way, not seeking the limelight, but has made the most of his opportunity to think of what his career, what it meant to Indiana State University, what it meant to the state of Indiana, what it means now to the Indiana Pacers. This is an extraordinary human being. Legend, that is the best word, really the only word to sum up Larry Bird. 
And that's why the story of his career will be told again and again for generations to come. At Indiana State, we're honored to have been part of it. Please welcome Indiana Pacers executives Jim Morris and Donnie Walsh. So Larry, you once told me and many, many other people that you would never, ever, ever coach, coach. ever. Well, I did, Rick and Dick did it. <laughs> but seriously, what changed your mind? Donnie, because I'm, I, I still talk to Donnie about, I said, Donnie, how did you ever get me to say, yes, I will coach the Indiana Pacers? I'm still wondering that too. Um, wasn't easy, but uh, we had her <laughs> around and around, but uh, I still can't believe that I did that. I mean, I enjoyed it once we was in there. I knew they had a very good team, a very good team. They were coming off of 30, I think 38 wins. They had some injuries. Right. But I always, I always told Donnie, I said, I can't believe they can't get to the finals. I think they're a finals team. And then next thing I know, there I'm sitting in Donnie's office, right. signing up for three years. So Donnie, when you make the phone call initially, are you thinking, well, this is a long shot? Or what do you? Well, I had kind of gotten word that Larry could be interested, and I was definitely interested. And so it went back and forth like that, but then we decided to meet in Indianapolis. And by that time, I already wanted to hire him. I didn't know if he wanted to take the job. But I thought we had a good chance because, as Larry said, we had a pretty good team who didn't play well the year before. We had our coach leaving for sure. And so I thought, well, maybe he'll want to come back to Indiana, and we have a pretty good team. So we met in an office. I think it might have been Herb Simon's office. I don't remember that. Uh, but it, it really, when I look back on it, and I'll get to that, it was almost like a lesson to me because you could call it an interview, but it wasn't really like that. I just said, Larry, what would you do with our team? And he went on, and he started at the first day of training camp and talked about what he would do in specific terms until we got to the finals of the NBA. Now this took over an hour, an hour and a half, something like that. Talked about every player, talked about every drill. I asked maybe one question, uh, Larry, who do you think you'd get as assistant coaches? Cause, and he said, oh, I have never coached before, so I gotta get good assistants. That's all I wanted to hear. And so in my mind, I wanted to do it. Well. He came for three years. We went to the Eastern Conference Finals all three years. Yeah, finals. We lost finals. two of the years, but to really good teams. Yeah. And one year we made it to the finals. And then he left. And I remember sitting there in the summer sometime, thinking back on Larry, and I'm thinking to myself, boy, that was the best time I ever had with any team. Everything worked like clockwork. The players had a lot of respect for Larry. It just went so well. And I had good coaches before that, but nothing quite like this. And then it hit me, and I said, well, you know what? That guy told me that the, the day in that interview, he told me exactly what he would do, and for three years, that's exactly what he did. No more, no less. Everything that he did, he told me in that one day. That's pretty remarkable. I don't think you could do that, Bill. <laughs> so, Jim, you have deep roots here at ISU. You also are, uh, are deep roots with the Indiana Pacers. The magnitude of the Indiana Pacers getting Larry Bird to be their coach, and now, of course, in their front office. Pretty amazing, right? Pretty immediate? Remarkable, actually. Uh, I personally think... Um, Larry loves the state of Indiana. Uh, he is as Hoosier as anybody could be. And I think he is exactly where he wants to be. I, I think he, uh, he, he, he yearns for the Pacers to uh, win the title. He wants that for the state of Indiana, uh, for the sport. Uh, his impact on our team 
and his impact on our city and our state uh, extraordinary. People say that he would want to be there, that he would live in Indianapolis, that he, he, and, uh, he, he loves southern Indiana. Uh, it, it's, um, for me, the fact that he wants, that, that this is what he wants to do, that he wants to be a part of who we Hoosiers are. Uh, this man could do anything in the world. We, we just took the Pacers to Manila in Taiwan, and he's as famous there as he is here. It's extraordinary, but he's, he's us, and, and I love that. And the respect he, uh, he receives from our players, from high school coaches in the state of Indiana, from his colleagues in the office, the, the, the work ethic, the commitment to do it right, there's no gray in this man. You do it right or wrong, you work harder, you don't. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's extraordinary. It, and by the way, this, this man is brilliant. Uh, his insight and intuition uh, into his business and the sport that he has dominated and led is remarkable. Uh, th this is an exceptional talent. No, and, and he loves being a Hoosier. And I love being a Hoosier. So, so one of my favorites. You know, all the characteristics that you know I've learned about Bird, just him, the person, and how that resonated on the basketball court, really are key qualities and good things you want as somebody that's a part of your staff, your one of your executive members or coaches. And they're in the offices now, but applying that same kind of mentality of I got to work, I have to work, I have to work, a sense of loyalty, work for every dollar I get, put forth my best effort, no matter what I do, not just on the basketball court with the player, but in all facets of life. Larry's one of those people that understood that. Stories when you first start. Kobe was too. Is, you, I think it was an exhibition game, maybe. Um, so anyone that knows Larry knows you, you better be on time because he's not going to wait for you, right? He's, that's the truth. So the, they all get on the plane, and Travis Best and Dale Davis are late. They're not on the plane. So Larry says, take it up. Take it up the wheels. We're leaving. We're leaving without two of our starters. They're going to be, we're going to leave them behind. Well, all of a sudden, the car comes zooming down the tarmac. They jump out of the car. They're there. The, the pilot stops, and Larry says, what are you stopping for? I told you, let's get going. And he left them both on the... <laughs> on the tarmac. Uh, I know, I like that too. What was the reaction of the guys on the plane when you did that? Well, it was funny because the jets were running, and you know, at, at the back end of that jets, but when he was running down through, you could see the wind hitting them. <laughs> Just stand there. But they cut the engines, and I said, you know, we, we leave at 3 o'clock. We leave at 3 o'clock every day. If there's an emergency, just call us and get mm -hmm. your own flight and get where we're going. But we can't hold up a whole team for one or two guys. And uh, I remember Reggie and some of the guys said, come on, coach, you can't do this. I said, well, we're going to do this. We're going to go by time. And when I say time, it means 3 o'clock. Or if you're, we're going to practice at 10. I did everything the same. We practice at 10 every day. We leave at 3 in the afternoon. If we got in one minute after 1 o'clock, we didn't have practice the next day. So players were cheering on the are uh, hollering at the, the pilots stay in the air for another half hour sometime. <laughs> but we, we did things by time. It wasn't a military type atmosphere, but Donnie can tell you we did things by the book and I laid it all out to him. But uh, Reggie didn't want to let the guys back on the, on the plane and, and we did and we took off and uh, I think they got fogged in the next morning. It was exhibition season too, by the way. Yeah. They got fogged in to make the practice so they got an extra fine on top of that. Uh, but you send a message, and, and the guys were great. I mean, that, that was a good team and uh, veteran team. And once we got it all ironed out how we were going to do things, it, it worked pretty smooth. So you did something extremely unconventional. You had Rick Carter and Dick Carter, yeah. Rick Carlisle and Dick Carter, excuse me, as your two coaches. Kind of an offense-defense thing. Right. That was a little unconventional at the time, not so much now. But also, you had Rick running your huddles 
and that, you know, at the time, I don't know if you realize that, that, that was caused a little bit of a stir in the league because no head coach had ever um, ceded such a big responsibility to an assistant before. Well, Rick, at the time, I was new, and he's pretty good at drawing the plays. I thought he was the best in the league at the time. But we started it, and I just said, hell, go ahead and do it. We ran basically the same plays at the beginning we did in Boston, even though we put in some pick and rolls and, 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 and a lot of flair and back screens and things like that. But, you know, offense is offense. Uh, it didn't bother me. I didn't have an ego where I thought, oh, i got to control these two guys. If you go in our league now, assistant coaches stay over there. The coach does all the talking. Right. And they do their stuff in the film room. I was never like that. If you're good at something, let the people do their work. And it just so happened it worked out for us. I mean, kind of like uh, positionless basketball, right? Larry, one of the pioneers of that, where it's like, yeah, I don't care what label you have as far as your position, but if you're good at something, you can do that too. Interesting concept. I was so fortunate to be able to work with them two guys and have a a boss that believed in us and had some players that wanted to win. And we had success that way. But three years was my max, and, and that's what I wanted to do. Uh, then I got out and uh, and get a call, and Donnie brings me back again. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's crazy. You know, I've always said about Donnie that I was able to wor work for Red Arbach, work for Dave Gavitt, right. and Donnie Walsh. Now, how can you beat that? Three of my favorite individuals of all time. That's a lot of knowledge. That's a lot of knowledge. So I've been fortunate, and I'm so happy he stayed this year. He says a consultant, but really, he, he's my right-hand man. We talk a lot. I come in and talk to Donnie about things I want to do. I, I remember this year I came back, and the first thing I want to do is improve the bench, and uh, we talk things out, and, and I, we got a good basketball team this year. And, you know, my number one goal is I, I've done – a lot of things in this league that I'm very proud of being able to accomplish. But I want to get the Pacers back to the NBA Finals. Well, well not me. I want to get, put a team together to get them back to the Finals. Because I always say, they always say, well, you never talk about winning them. you got to get there first. Mm -hmm. and I know how hard these championships are to, 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 to win. So let's get there first. And once we get there, we'll figure out a way to win it. So, Donnie, you've been with the Pacers a long, long time. Um, Larry came back this year after a very short hiatus. Um, what, what, what does it feel like? What, what, what can you feel among the players and the, and the coaches and the personnel and everybody? What's the, what was the vibe like when, when he came well, back? Well, I think that you know a lot of these players Larry had picked in the draft right. and had built the team. He left for a year, but, and they did, had a good year. But I think that when he came back, it kind of legitimized them again because they knew that the team was his team, and you know, if he stayed away, they would have probably wondered about it. They would have gone on, but they would have wondered about it. Now he comes back. I thought it was a great thing to happen for the team, and I think that Larry, I've always felt this way as a coach, but more so now as a GM, that he is the guy that should be the head of the Indiana Pacers, because he came from here. You know, his exploits are legendary, and then he comes back, coach gets coach of the year. He had already been player of the year, I don't know how many times. And then he gets executive of the year. So you got the perfect guy here. And somewhere along the line in that combination, they're going to win a championship. And I don't know how, all right, but he will will them to a championship somehow. I just feel that way. Jim, what would it be like for Indianapolis if the Pacers can win an NBA championship? What will that do to the city of Indianapolis? We beat Chicago this week, uh, full house. And by the way, uh, you should know that we beat Toronto tonight. Uh, <laughs> six and oh, the only undefeated team in the NBA. But. Uh, <laughs> Our packed house against Chicago was unbelievable. The, the excitement, the, 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 what it means to a community. You know, professional sports, one of those things that brings everybody together. It's a huge community building, unifying asset. And uh, what basketball means to our city and to our state, and the notion that we do this as one, we're all there cheering for our, our team, uh, 
it's unbelievable the excitement um, that uh, our city has right now for the Indiana Pacers and, and to win the championship. You know, the Colts won the Super Bowl a few years ago. It was an extraordinary experience. We hosted the Super Bowl this past year, an unbelievable experience for the whole state, and, and the pinnacle would be for us to win the NBA championship. All right, just one final question for you, Larry. You have this team. I'm not sure what year this is, but I'm assuming based on their 6-0 start, this was the Paul George, David West, Roy Hibbert, um, George Hill. Not sure if Danny Granger was still on the team. I'm guessing it was that squad based on their 6-0 start, which they had a good team. You know, they very well could have won a championship, possibly, if it wasn't for the uh, Miami Heat. Big three. Team, you great team you've assembled. Paul George, I think, is going to be a legitimate MVP I candidate. I spoke too soon. Year. He's taking that next step up. You've added C.J. Watson, Lewis Scully. You've done a lot of good things. What is it about this team that grabs you? It's early. I know it's early. But... Well, it is, and, and, but they are good. You know, I, I know they're good. Uh, everybody's talking about the exhibition season, but that means nothing. This team is committed to one another. Uh, a few years ago, we brought David West in. We had some good players. We brought David in. But he did exactly what I was hoping that somebody would do. He would get these guys together and make them believe that if they did things the right way, we had a chance to compete for the high, in, in the highest level. And if you see our players improve, just like this summer. I've been there. I watched Roy there all summer working hard and all that. But Lance Stevenson this summer put in the most work and the hardest work of anybody that we had that probably stayed there. I can't believe I forgot to mention Lance Stevenson. Can't believe that. Silly. My bad. There, what, the only last five or six years? Oh, yeah. He, he's a well, it's Lance. showing. Yeah. It's showing. He worked early. as hard as anybody I've seen this summer and worked on his weaknesses and got better and shooting is much better. And he did it. He was in the gym every day, all day. And Roy did that. You know, and, mm -hmm. but you just see these kids want to be great, and, and they want to play in Indiana. Uh, we have all beautiful, well, I call them kids, hell, some of them are 32 years old. But, I mean, they, they, they want to be a team. They want to be special. They want to do their community work in the city. Uh, they're just special people, and that's what makes me more proud. I know they're good basketball players, but they're better people, and that's the one thing I like about them. You don't have... Not one problem with these guys. They show up on time. They know what we expect. Uh, I, I, I love every one of them. But I think everybody knows that Lance might be my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Lance. Okay, well, let, I want to thank Donnie and Jim for coming up here. Um, let's have a thank nice you. round of applause for them. And um, the university does have a special presentation. So you gentlemen can go, you cannot. Please welcome to the stage President of Indiana State University, Dr. Dan Bradley, the President of the Indiana State University Foundation, Ron Carpenter, and the Director of the ISU Alumni Association, Rex Kendall. Good evening. For the last 56 years, the Alumni Association has been privileged to award 240 alumni with our most prestigious recognition, the Indiana State University Distinguished Alumni Award. This award is the highest honor alumni receive from the Alumni Association. It recognizes alumni who have modeled success, leadership, and service to their community and is awarded to alumni who have embraced and carried out the university's mission. Larry, uh, truly as exhibited by tonight, you're one of our most famous and most recognized uh, alumnus uh, uh, in a Sycamore history. Uh, you also touch that you're known worldwide and your name is synonymous with Indiana State. 
It's not only because of that uh, gift that you've given back to the university as far as, but your work ethic, your success in your careers, uh, and your current, your always drive for success. So with that being stated, it's great we're finally erecting a statue for you, obviously tomorrow, hopefully you can all be there tomorrow to witness that as well, but also to recognize you as a 241st uh, distinguished alumnus and probably number one in everyone's heart at least tonight. So thank you very much, Larry. Thank everyone for coming out tonight. Uh, obviously, my family and I, and I are so thrilled to, to be a part of this. I have a lot of friends here. A lot of you don't see enough, but I know you took time out of your life to be here tonight, and, and it's very special to me. Um, I'm not big on, it. I guess, things like this, <laughs> but I, I know what it means. I know how. It touches a lot of people's lives. Uh, some people like it, some don't. But for me to have a statue erected outside a Holman Center is unbelievable. I didn't come here for that. I came here to get an education and play the game that I truly loved. And the one thing about playing, you know, you hear all the stories, and if you dedicate yourself to something that you really love, your dreams will come true. I know I'm living proof of that. So thank you for coming tonight, and God bless you. Thank you, Larry Bird. Your contributions to Indiana State University and Sycamore basketball are unparalleled. Your legacy is an important part of our history. We're proud to recognize you, Dean, and family through honoring, uh, through honoring a legend. Well, if anyone deserves a statue. It's Larry Bird. Rick Patino. Uh, congratulations, Larry, and congratulations, um, Indiana State, for recognizing the greatest player ever to put on a, a uniform there. And he's one of the greatest NBA basketball players, one of the greatest college players, and every single person who's ever played basketball tries to emulate Larry Bird. Larry Legend Foundation. Nope. As alumni, you can always be proud of your contributions to our university. The Larry Bird statue is impressive. You truly portrayed the likeness of Larry Bird during the Indiana State years. Well, that's the guy that I guess created it. Amy and Greg Gibson, thank you for being a partner honoring the Legend Weekend. I can't hey, read Eric. fast enough. Clyde here. Just wanted to say congratulations, man. Well deserved. And congratulations. Hopefully we'll be there. And uh, we love you, man. One of the greatest ever. Clyde the Glide. Jackie, thank you for hosting the honor, um, Honoring a Legend program. You have helped us pay trip to Larry's entire basketball career. Well, you could capture that since Larry Bird. Some, some, some. Thank you, Honoring a Legend program participants. The relationships you share with Larry are unique and personal. Your contributions Ladies and gentlemen, thank evening. you for joining us this evening. We look forward to seeing you at the statue dedication tomorrow morning at 1130. Now it's time for our crew to flip this venue and get ready for game day tomorrow. Have a good night. Larry, uh, Mr. Bird. <laughs> Dolph you were my, uh, Favorite basketball player after I had retired. I love the way you, you played. Uh, your enthusiasm for the game was it was, it was terrific, and uh, good luck and well-deserved. Hey, Larry, congratulations. That's Gee. a big honor. You know, you're going just like Magic. I know y'all battled all the time. Magic got a statue, now you're getting a statue. Great. You know what? 
I wish I could have played against you a little bit more in your prime and everything. It would have been a big thrill for me. But you know what? Even watching you as I grew up, it still inspired me to play great basketball. Hey, congratulations. You deserve it. You're one of the greatest ever. And I know you, I know you, I know you know that. So, hey, this is me, the glove, wishing you all the best in everything you do. See you. The glove. Congratulations, Larry, uh, on the statue that's being unveiled for you at uh, Indiana State. And you certainly deserve it. I enjoyed all the years that we competed against one another. You're just one of the great, great, great ones. And I can never defend you. The great Bernard King. Larry, I wanted to say congratulations. It's an honor well deserved. You know, it took him so long. You know, one of the greatest players to ever play this game. And it was a pleasure for me to go up against you all those years. And I tell you what, you only made one Larry Bird. And man, let me tell you, man, this is an honor that's well deserved. It was a pleasure to know you and be a friend and a colleague. Congratulations to Larry Bird. Hey, what can you say about one of the greatest to ever play the game? Larry, you've been an unreal. If I were on TV talking about you, I'd say you're a PT peer, solid goal, primetime performer, and you're awesome, baby, and the 3S man, super scintillating <laughs> sensation. Thank you to the individuals and organizations that have contributed to the film, photos, and interviews included in the Honoring a Legend video series. Larry, I am so proud that ISU is putting that statue of you up where it belongs. I know you really don't want it, but we do because you had such an effect not only on the community, but on all of us. You deserve it. Proud of you. The planning committee. Hello everyone, Reggie Miller here and Coach Bird, because I'll call you Coach Bird. It's hard for me to say Larry Bird because uh, the great time that we spent together when you were at the helm of our, our Indiana Pacers. Congratulations on the statue. I, I think it's long overdue. You will forever be the face of Indiana basketball. It was an honor and a pleasure to play under you. It was an honor and pleasure to play with you in a couple of all-star games. So congratulations and uh, I'm so happy for you. this together man Zabaskara Ko Tampa All right that was that was a fun time that was a lot of fun that was a sensational event dedication interview event whatever you want to call it Indiana State University dining and statue erection memorial service. I don't know. Call it what you want. That was fire, man. <laughs> the the chemistry between everybody on set was great. Even when the tempers were flaring just a tad bit and people were rocking in a chair just a tad bit. It, it was it was perfect. It's probably exactly what this needed to. It needed a little bit of that fire. I liked it. Bill Walton brought it, Chief brought it, everybody. It was dope. It was dope. It was dope. 
Um, big shout out to Jackie, first of all. Big shout out to Jackie. She is an, she is an excellent uh, moderator and host, if you will. Say moderator, I guess. She really walks that line perfectly of, of knowing when to interject posing the question appropriately and given the floor space for the the people to talk and knows when to ad lib in and maybe maybe throw in a rebuttal when necessary she is not overbearing at all she is she is the perfect moderator she did an exceptional job and she did an exceptional job and you know handling the bill walton situation when he when he you know gotten his guy was Bill, Bill Walton was Bill Walton, basically. Bill Walton was Bill Walton. And she, I think she handled it well on both sides from from Chief and Bill. She she handled it well. She handled it well. So, you know, big shout out to Jackie, man. And she did an exceptional job as the main author of, of the book with, you know, him and Larry Bird when the game was ours. And, uh, yeah, she uh, she just comes off as a phenomenal woman, good heart, good sense of humor, and she she can she can really take things well and 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 stay the course and you know focus on the task at hand and see it through, man. She did an exceptional job. So big shout out to Jackie, first of all. I really like how they put this whole event together. It was sensational. I like how they segued from you know this part of his. His journey, segue, this part of his journey, segue, this part of his journey, bringing the people that were associated with that part, let them talk about it. But it was more than just basketball. That's one thing I did like. Don't get me wrong. I love hearing the basketball side of things. And we did get some basketball things in there. But it was also a lot of all the things going around at the time off the basketball court that may have led to certain events on the basketball court or led to certain important events in Larry Bird's life. You know what I mean? All that stuff happening behind the scenes that we really didn't know what was going on until we heard about these people talk about them, talk about the good old days. And it, I, I, I thought that was awesome to hear all that stuff, man. It, it, it was great. It was entertaining. It was fun. You add Larry in, of course, with his great sense of humor, wise guy, cracker, not cracker as in a racist comment, but like wise cracker. <laughs> not, not calling Larry Bird a cracker. He's a wise cracker. He's he's with the lip. You know, he's good. He's a smack talker. He's a shit talker. He's he has great rebuttals. Uh and, <clears throat> and Larry was just Larry was just phenomenal, man. Larry was just phenomenal. Got nothing but love for Larry Bird, man. I love his personality so much. And even when he was looking at her, because she was she was trying to get she was posing the questions and she was waiting for the immediate feedback of the answer, whatever the answer was. But they just kept joking and giving her sarcastic comments. And he, he Larry just looked at her like, oh, you really serious? <laughs> I love it, man. He's a wise cracking, shit talking asshole, man. Uh, it takes me back to... Uh, my days, man, back when I was in high school, we used to have crack. Uh, crack, we call it crack sessions, crack sessions, where we would all just crack her up. We would all just crack her. Me and my boys were cracker, and we would just sit in a room and talk shit about each other. Wise cracking, shit talking, crack sessions, what we call them. We'd be bored. My town, growing up, there wasn't a whole lot to do, so we call each other up on the phone, landline, no cell phones at the time. Yo, we we all about to meet at Ivan's house. Yo, we about to let's do let's do a crack session. Let's get it on. Bet I'll be there. <laughs> crack sessions, man. But no, nah, it it was fun, man. That 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 was well put together. Everybody's involvement, you know, all the little bits and pieces that people, you know, added to the story and gave insight and context and you know, you really was just envisioning everything and putting myself in that situation. I was like, man, this is really cool. This is really cool, man. It's awesome. Larry has a great personality, super humble. And, you know, I've never seen a player get this kind of treatment from all the different facets of this player's life, all the different organizations he was in, all the different committees he was in, all this stuff. And they all all of them do this guy right, pay homage, pay homage to him, show their respect for him, dedicate things to him, 
from all levels. And I think part of it has to do with the fact that just Larry Bird's demeanor, like we know what his demeanor is, but if you ever got to know Larry the person, you'd understand how he functions, how he, he stands on his morals, it's just a good, solid person that was brought up the right way. And he was able to maintain a good rapport with all these people over the years, and they have no problem coming back together um, to dedicate things like this to him. You know what I mean? And that says a lot about Larry Bird, the person, just like what, what his old coach. Larry Bird went out the way to send him a gift with a handwritten note, things like that. That stuff doesn't go unnoticed. That stuff doesn't get forgotten. But he had a heart like that. And you give that kind of energy out to people and you will get it back. It will be reciprocated. And I think that's one of the big reasons why I see Larry Bird getting these kind of dedications from all these different, you know, areas that he participated in, in his life and giving back to him. Maybe there's other players that have sound similar. I just have to come across them. I haven't really seen them. But, um, I mean, Larry Bird is getting whole ass events, bro. Like <laughs> two hour events and interviews and things. It's like, wow, man. Like, Larry really made an impact in these people's lives and with these organizations. And, you know, and I'm glad they highlighted all his accolades post NBA playing career as a coach, as an executive, all that stuff. I'm sorry, Larry. My Lakers had to do it to you in the 2000 finals. Y'all had a squad. I know y'all had a squad with Reggie Miller and them boys, but. You know what I mean? Shaq got fouled out. Kobe took over. Hit him with some crossovers, some clutch baskets, you know. Hurt his ankle, Reggie Miller. I mean, not Reggie Miller. Freaking Jalen Rose tried to injure Kobe on purpose. Rolled his ankle. Kobe missed one game. Came back with a big swollen ankle. Gutted it out the rest of the series to help win the championship. Sorry, Larry, we had to do it to you that time, but you still gangster, baby, Larry. You still a gangster, baby. Woo, all right. That's all I got to say about this one. I could go on ranting forever about this, but this was awesome. This was awesome. I enjoyed the whole hour, 58 minute, two hour plus. It was great. Like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell. Hey, I want to know what y'all thought about this one in the comment section. Drop your opinions in the comment section, please. Thank you. Appreciate you. And I catch you on the next one. Stay blessed. We out, baby.